to our third webinar. It's uh, great to have you all here. Today, we are joined by Prakash Chandran from Zano, co-founder and co-CEO of San Zano. Prakash, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you here. Pleasure to be um, here. Yeah, thank you. Um, the topic of today's webinar is we're going to be learning how APIs work and how to make your own with Zano. I used Zano myself earlier this year and was blown away um, by the power of it. So I think it's going to be a really interesting one, regardless of what level you're at, if you're a developer or you're just new to no code. So I'm going to pass over to um, Prakash and he's going to take it from here. Okay, fantastic. Well, um, I just started sharing my screen. So hopefully all of you can see what I'm sharing. Um, I am very excited to be here. Um, Josh, thank you so much for having me. Um, that's what I wanted to just say first is I really appreciate everything that the No Code Founders community uh, is doing for No Code. Um, you know, you I know you worked on a project with uh, DraftBit and, and us just a, a couple months ago, and um, it, it was great. And so thank you for everything uh, that you're doing. So. Uh, in any case, uh, as Josh mentioned, my name is Prakash Chandran. I am one of the co-founders and co-CEO of Xano.com. Um, if you are interested in connecting with me, I'm at Prakasam on Twitter. Uh, in terms of what we're going to do today, I'm going to spend uh, approximately the first 25 minutes just going over what an API is, right? Like, uh, everything from the basics around how software works today, um, the construct of an API, the anatomy of an API, and then I'm going to hop into Xano and kind of show you how the creation of one works. And if we have some time, we might even get into some fun stuff, connecting with external API services, and we'll definitely leave some time at the end for questions. So if you have questions, um, you know, certainly feel free to put them in the chat as you have them, but I'll address them at the end of this discussion. Um, so just getting started and going through this, I'm gonna, I'll try to keep it fun and abstract, um, but let's just talk at a very high level about how software works today. Most of you on this call understand this, but there's two major components to any piece of software. That are, there's a front end, which is what the user sees, and then there is the back end, which is all of the business logic behind the scenes. Um, an example that I like to always give is Amazon's one-click buy. You might have a button on the front end. The user sees that button and they click it and magically, sometimes within less than 24 hours, a package magically ends up at their doorstep. But in the back end, there's a lot that needs to happen in order to make that package be delivered, right? It has to check you are who you say you are. It has to charge your credit card. It has to check if there's inventory. It has to contact distribution centers. There may be like a hundred things that happen uh, in the back end to make that uh, package be delivered. And so we like to say that 20% of the development work is the front end and 80% of the development work is in the back end. And so that's why having a no-code back end like Xano that allows you to do all these things um, is awesome. So talking about the back end specifically, there's different dynamics of how it works, but I like to try to abstract it using a restaurant metaphor. Those of you that have kind of seen me in videos before, I always use this, so I, I apologize if I'm being repetitive, but it's the easiest way that I can tell you about the back end and then the API. So if you go to a restaurant, you know, there's a customer. That customer might place an order with a waiter, right? Like I want a cheeseburger with extra mustard. That waiter then takes that custom order and brings it over to the kitchen, right? Kitchen makes the cheeseburger extra mustard, gives it to the waiter and makes a happy customer. So in this metaphor, the customer is actually the front end or the website, right? And they give a custom command to the waiter or that messenger, which is the API. That API is responsible for taking commands from the front end and running it to the back end. And the back end is really your hosting uh, or your server and database. So it's the thing that processes um, everything that makes your API and then your app work. So now that you have like a good sense of the API and where it sits in the back end, it's just important to know broadly that APIs are the glue of the internet, right? They make everything work and they are what connect one service uh, along with another service, right? And so when we think about APIs and the APIs that exist on the internet today, um, there's a couple popular ones that I'm sure all, all of you are familiar with. The first is Google Maps, right? 
you know, you might uh, be building an application that needs a user to enter in, for example, a zip code or a place and have a business show up. Now, it doesn't make sense for you or your app to store all of the businesses in the world. Why not leverage Google Maps API or their waiter to get all of that information? You might have also heard of a uh, API called Stripe, right? They set up an entire payments infrastructure so you don't have to worry about building it yourself. So if you're taking a charge uh, from a customer or doing uh, recurring revenue from a customer, just let them handle the payments and then you can focus on delivering the value that your app brings. And then finally, there's Twilio. Surprisingly, not a lot of people know about Twilio, but they're a messaging platform and they allow you to leverage their infrastructure to do SMS and email and things of that nature. And so... One interesting thing is that APIs can be leveraged on top of each other. So for example, Airbnb leverages all three of these APIs. They'll use Google Maps to show all of the locations of the availability of the places to stay. They'll use Stripe right, to charge you when you want to stay at a place. And they'll use Twilio uh, for SMS confirmations and email uh, confirmations when you book a stay. And so the, then on top of the Airbnb, your app can even leverage Airbnb's API, right? So Airbnb might have an accommodations API. And if you were building like an event, a live event type system, and you want to look for local places to stay, you might leverage uh, Airbnb's API. So APIs make the world go around. They connect one service to another. And also importantly, is they also connect your app directly to your users. So let's say you're building a kitchen app and your uh, users are, are waiters that want to see the inventory in the kitchen, those APIs are, are the commands that the waiter knows to get the information from what the kitchen has to the front end and what your waiter sees. So again, that waiter is that messenger that runs between the customer and your kitchen, which is basically the server and database and kind of makes things happen. It also can connect to third-party services. So now that you have a good primer on how that works, let's just talk about the different types of APIs that exist. So I'm gonna go over this at a high level, but I think it's important that you understand. So the different types of API protocols are what you're seeing here. And by far and away, the most popular API protocol is called REST. It stands for Representational State Transfer. Older uh, models are JSON RPC and SOAP, and there's also GraphQL. So before we're going to focus today on REST specifically, um, but before I do that, I want to just talk briefly about GraphQL because it's all the rage. A lot of people are talking about it. GraphQL is actually a protocol that was invented by Facebook that leverages REST. So you can imagine like a feed, a Facebook feed uh, of your uh, posts. Each post, right, might have likes associated with it. It might have comments associated with it there could be a number of different things that represent different requests that that waiter has to run to the server and get. So maybe if you're doing it for like 10 users, that's fine. But across billions of users, that's a lot of resources. So GraphQL basically is a way to, in the same request, get all the related information. And luckily with a tool like Xano, you're able to actually leverage GraphQL's type power using the uh, RESTful protocol. So focusing here on REST, let's talk a little bit about the anatomy of an API call and how it actually works, okay? So when we think about an API call, remember that example that I used with the uh, customer placing an order with the kitchen? So you have the customer, which is the front end. That can be represented in a mobile application or a web application. They make a request to that waiter, which is the API, right? That API, that waiter takes that command, the cheeseburger with extra mustard, and goes over to the server. The server typically consists of your database and the power that makes everything run. That server will process that request and then send over a response, okay? So right now we're gonna focus on the anatomy, exactly what that request looks like. So the request itself, there's four different request types, create, read, update, delete. These are called your CRUD operations. You've probably heard of this before. It's the simplest form or the simplest knowledge that that waiter knows to go create items, to delete them, to read them, and to update them, okay? And each one of these commands is associated with a method, an HTT method, post, get, put, and delete. 
So this is kind of the world around API protocols, the anatomy of the request. So let's actually go through an example so you can kind of see this working in action. So let's say that there's an API call or a request called how many cheeseburgers are in my kitchen. So looking at the anatomy of this API request, there's a couple different components. So the first, as I mentioned, is the method or the operation. So what do you want to do? You want to get you want to get the uh, cheeseburgers from the kitchen. So you have to specify that method, get. The second thing is the actual URL that contains this command. So what you're seeing over here, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but yourwebsite.com slash API, this is called the base request URL. It's usually like yourapp.com slash API is where people are going to go to access that information. And this kitchen portion is called the resource. You're getting the resource of that kitchen and you're sending the information back. The third piece are the headers. Headers contain authentication, encoding, caching, things of that nature. The most important thing that you need to know for headers are authentication, because sometimes you might want to lock down an API endpoint and you want to contain authentication in the headers. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. And the final thing is input parameters. So when you call this API request, you need an input from the user or that customer. So the customer is going to say, how many cheeseburgers are in my kitchen, right? So the input you would take, that input parameter is the cheeseburger itself, okay? So that is the anatomy of the request. Now let's talk about the response, the response from the kitchen. So the response consists of three major components. The first is the status. You've probably seen this before, status 200, status 400. Uh, the best thing to do if you wanna know about the different status codes in your API is to go to Google and just type in status codes API and you'll get a list of them. At a very high level, in the 200 range is a good thing. That means everything completed successfully. When you're in the 400 range, that means that things are, are bad or maybe you're unauthorized. There's a couple of uh, different codes, but it's uh, important to kind of get used to them. So I would definitely recommend Googling them. The second thing is the server also sends its own headers. When was the date of this request? What's the type of server, the content type, et cetera? And then finally is the JSON payload, right? So you've probably heard of JSON before. Some people call it JSON. JSON, some people call it JSON. I'm not ex exactly sure the exact way it's supposed to be said, um, but this is called JavaScript object notation. And any API request sends this payload and that gets rendered then to your front end. So we just covered the request and the response. And then we said that in the response, it's going to send you back that JSON payload. So what I want to do right now is I want to go into Xano. And from scratch, I want to build this request of getting cheeseburgers from the database. And I'll kind of show you how this works. So in Xano, if you don't have an account, you can go ahead and create one. It's completely free. Uh, and we allow you to do like 90% of the things that you would normally do outside of a paid plan. So I highly recommend that. So I just basically created a demo workspace that has a user, right? Um, a user database table. So I'm gonna actually create a database table right now called kitchen. So I'll say kitchen. And then you can see add basic CRUD endpoints. We just learned about this. CRUD is create, read, update, delete. What this says is Xana will automatically create these API endpoints that will get records, update them, delete them from your database table for you. So I'm gonna click add table. Now I'm taken to the kitchen table. I wanna add a couple different field types. The first field type I'm gonna add is text. And you can see this is like a spreadsheet view if you are used to it. We're just adding different fields that we're gonna then populate. So the first field type I'm going to add is called item, right? And that's gonna contain my kitchen items. And then I'll go ahead and add an integer, which is the quantity of items that exist. So here, if in the item, I'm going to say this is a cheeseburger, right? And let's just say that there are five cheeseburgers. And let's just add a couple more, right? Let's just say that I have fries and there's three fries. And then I'll also say there is soda and this is one, uh, one soda. Okay, so in my database, I've now stored three items, right? Cheeseburger, fries, and soda. So this is my database section. Now I wanna to go to the API section, right? So the API, if I click on this group, you can see Xano has automatically generated a lot of different API endpoints. You can think of API endpoints as the commands that that messenger knows, right? And so for example, 
These are the CRUD operations for kitchen that were automatically created for me. So if I click in this get kitchen right now, this is our no code API builder. The inputs, right? The first section is the inputs that we get from the user. The second is the functions that gets executed. And the third is what's being returned to the front end. So if I run this right now, I can see that it's going to return, no surprise, those three items from the database. But the request that I actually want is how many cheeseburgers are in the kitchen? So I'm actually going to go through and add a new API endpoint, right? So in order to do that, in my API section, I'm going to click this Add API Endpoint. I'll just start from scratch because it's the easiest way to do this. And then I'm just going to say, um, get cheeseburgers. And I'm going to say, save. OK, great. And so um, the first thing that I want, remember, we needed in this request, we can actually look at the uh, anatomy of this request over here. We want to get a request from that user, the input parameter. So here in the input, I'm just going to call this um, requested item, right? And remember, that might be like a, a text field on your front end that you're requesting from the user. Then in the function, what I want to do is I can go ahead and click add. I can go database request. And I can, uh, I can actually do query all records. That's totally fine. And I can go into the kitchen. So there is the function that goes the query all records from the kitchen, but I'm able to actually filter. Remember, I want to make sure that what you're sending me back is actually what I'm requesting, which is the cheeseburger. So there's this thing called filter in query all records, which I'm going to go ahead and hit edit. I'll add a conditional. And I want to say, hey, I want to make sure that the input coming in from the user, that requested item, remember, that's what I specified over here, actually equals the uh, kitchen.item. Remember, this is the database kitchen. I want to make sure that those things equal. And that's what I want you to return. So now, if I run this, it's asking me, well, what is the requested item? right? So I'm going to say, OK, well, I want a cheeseburger. And when I run this, I should only get back my cheeseburger. And I can see that there's a quantity of five. All right, let's go back to the presentation. We just built an API endpoint from scratch that went to the database and said, hey, tell me what you want as a user and return back a JSON payload, which tells me how many cheeseburgers are in the kitchen. So going back to this presentation and looking at the response, right? let's look at the response itself. It has the ID, which is the identifier of the record number in the database, the created at, this is a Unix timestamp that you can co uh, convert to human readable timestamp, the item itself and the quantity. Now, what most people do not understand is that this JSON payload over here actually gets rendered to the front end. So whether you're using Bubble, Adalo, DraftBit, or a Java, it doesn't matter what front end you're using, the JSON payload gets rendered directly to the mobile app or the web application just like this. So this um, cheeseburger.item would be right over here and cheeseburger.quantity would be this five remaining over here, right? And so if I go back to Xano, this endpoint URL, that's an API endpoint URL, this is a command that the waiter now understands how to get cheeseburgers. And actually more broadly, how to get items. Remember, I didn't request an item. It's not just cheeseburgers, it's any item. And if I took this uh, endpoint URL and I, you know, posted it in Bubble or a dollar or whatever tool I'm using, um, I could then use that, right, to get uh, data from my Xano database. And most people also don't realize that um, the uh, browser is a form of a front end. So if I paste this in to my browser, this is a public endpoint right over here, right? So I'm not providing in the input here, so it doesn't work. And the browser actually can't take an input. So let me just go to get kitchen. Let me do endpoint URL here. If I type that in, I'm seeing all of that JSON payload, right? So even though the browser isn't meant to render things beautifully like other applications are, you can just see the example that I'm giving over here. So going back to the presentation, let's talk now about authenticated requests, right? How many cheeseburgers are in the kitchen? But I don't want anyone to have access to that information. I only want for example, the waiters at my restaurant to have access to that information. So let's talk about how this typically works. The front end, right, will make a request to the server. And the waiter is going to be like, whoa, wait a second, you don't have access to this. I, I can't tell you from anyone else. Like, how do I know that you are 
one of the waiters in my application. So then it becomes, then comes the question, well, how do I make an authenticated API request? Well, typically that's done through a login screen, right? That's why you log in. You are uh, logging in with an email and a password. And then once you log in with an email and password, this is exactly what happens. Like 80 to 90% of the time when you are logging into an application, it goes to the server, it verifies who you are, and it generates a JWE access token that then gets passed and allows you to see the things that you're supposed to. So let's actually go back to Xano and I'll show you an example of how to build an authenticated endpoint. So I'm gonna go back to Xano, right? And I'm gonna go back to my little database section over here. Now I have this user table and I haven't added anyone uh, as a user. So I'm gonna go ahead and add myself. So I'm gonna go ahead and add Prakash. I'll do Prakash at email.com and I'm gonna do a super secure password of password one, two, three. All right, so I am the first user in the user table over here. So now that the user exists in here, I can go back to my API in this group. And you can see that Xano has automatically created these authentication endpoints. Now, when a user is logging in or signing up, what people don't realize is those are endpoints that the waiter like takes that information and does things with it. So if I go to my auth login endpoint, you can see the inputs that it takes in are an email and a password. It then checks the user. It makes sure that their password is valid and then it hands back that token, right? So if I run and debug this, it's asking for an email and password. And remember what I told you, on the front end over here, um, it, this is exactly what you would see on the front end, but when the user hits submit, it would then call this API endpoint. So let's go ahead and log in and get that token that I can give. So um, actually, before I do that, let's go ahead and go to that get cheeseburgers endpoint and let's lock it down. So right now it's a public endpoint. I can click it and I can make sure that I require user authentication. So uh, I need that token now in order to actually access that information. So going back, I'm going to go to that login and I'm gonna run. And then remember, I've created that my first user in the database is just myself, Prakash. So Prakash at email.com. And then I'm gonna say password one, two, three. So now that I've uh, executed this, lo and behold, I have an authentication token. So I take this token, right? Then I can go back to my get cheeseburgers endpoint. I can run and I can paste in that token. I can still leave the cheeseburger there and I hit run and then I have that successful request, okay? So what just happened there? What I would have done is I would have built an app. I would have built that front end that takes an email and password. When the user clicks that, it first calls this auth login endpoint that then successfully gives me a token. I take that token and I pass it to the front end and I validate who I am. Now, just three pieces of information about most tokens on the web. And there's lots of different ways that you can modify this, but you, usually it's a one-time token. So if Josh comes to my app, he's a waiter at my restaurant, he logs in, it, if he successfully logs in, it's going to first tell the app who he is, right? This is Josh, he's logging in. The second thing is expiration or TTL, time to live. This means how good is his session uh, um, alive for? So like sometimes you're using apps and it's like, oh, you need to log in again. That's because each login token has an expiration associated with it. Usually it's 24 hours. Sometimes it can be a whole month, depending on the type of app you're using. Um, but you can set it for five seconds if you wanted and have people keep logging in. And then there's extras. There's like extra information that you could go ahead and send along. Um, so that is basically how an authenticated request works. This is how an authenticated um, or an API request works. This is how an authenticated API request works. And the last thing that I want to cover before we move on to the next session over here is um, why actually have a separate backend to process this? There's lots of no-code tools that actually have all-in-one solutions like their own database, and you don't have to build APIs. There's a couple of reasons that I think I want you to take away from this session. The first is that one backend to uh, power many front ends is best in practice. So what do I mean by that? You might be building a web application, let's just call it in uh, bubble, but you might also have a native mobile application in a different no-code tool, right? And you might also have an admin portal, right? That you are using to manage all of your users. 
You need one central point of contact with all of your information to use the APIs to spread out information uh, to all of those users. That's why it's so good to have one centralized backend. The second thing is code development made easy. Sometimes if you're dealing with workflows and you have like front end and back end workflows mixed together, it can be really confusing. So it's better if you're working with a team to have one person focused on the back end business logic API endpoints and the other focused on the front end. The third piece is that you want to use a tool that is built for transforming and storing data, for building and hosting these APIs and uh, taking data from multiple sources, which we're about to get into. Um, and Xeno obviously specializes in that. And then finally, you want something that's built for scale. You want something that you can start with and then scale with over time. You don't want to have to uh, rebuild it or you don't want to have to hire a team of engineers. You want one centralized backend and you want it to start and scale with it uh, over time very easily. So it's been 30 minutes and I've kind of covered most of that uh, piece of information. I can go back into Xano and we can have some fun connecting with some external APIs, but I wanted to give uh, you all a chance to ask any high level questions um, that you wanted before I moved into that next section. So I'll just take a pause and I'll pop, uh, pop chat open. All right. So I don't see anyone here with a question yet. Does any, Josh, did you see one come in that I'm not seeing? No, no, no questions at the moment. I can't hear you, Josh. Can, can you hear me? Oh, wait, I know why. Hold on. My audio went off because I was talking too much. Go ahead and say it again. Uh, that's okay. <laughs> there we no, go. Yeah, there's okay. no questions at the moment. I, I do have one, actually, if I can show one. <clears throat> okay, awesome. Actually, yeah. There, well, so this is the first question, and I'll get to your question. What is the difference versus Appier versus the control of building the connections and uh, your own calls? So that, this is a great question. Most people don't realize, but a Zap is just an API call from one service to another. Now, they make it ultra simple to connect these two services. And if you're just doing a simple connection or even just simple business logic, I actually recommend that you should use a tool like Zapier. They make it amazingly easy. Um, however, usually when you're building a custom application, there's usually no zap for your app, right? Or when you want to bring in like a lot of different external APIs and play around with, which I'll do here in a little bit, you're going to need more flexibility around the business logic that you can actually define, um, you know, right over here, right? This is only one function, but you might have 20 things that it does, right? Like you would never do an Amazon delivery service in, in Zapier. Um, so that is kind of the difference. It's the first thing that's important to understand is Zapier just making API calls on your behalf. They make it super easy. But if you want to build something more complex, it makes sense for you to uh, build out on your own. Um, all right. So Josh, did you have a question before I move forward? Yes. Um, so it was just when you mentioned um, built to scale as uh, Zeno's built to scale. So I think one of the a question that comes up a lot in the no code community is how scalable certain no code solutions are. And it seems that having a dedicated backend is is one way to do that. So how scalable is Xano? Like is there a point that they'd get to that they'd have to move off Xano or can it scale all the way to enterprise? It can scale all the way to enterprise and beyond. So the reason I can say this confidently is um, our uh, other co-CEO is, is our technical co-founder, co he's Sean Montgomery. Um, he actually uh, was the one responsible for the DevOps uh, developer operations for Google Photos. So it started with a server on his desk, and it is the underpinning of what powers Google Photos, which, as you probably know, hosts like a large portion of the world's photos. And so that is in the DNA of how we built Xano. We actually started from the ground up to build an infrastructure that has all of the best practices around um, scaling your company. So a lot of these logos you might not be familiar with, but we basically are hosted on Google Cloud. Obviously, we, uh, my, I was at Google, Sean was at Google. We understand the Google infrastructure ecosystem. We give you a dedicated uh, resources that's provisioned by Docker, which uh, leads to stability and ensuring that your, um, your instance is basically constantly up to date with uh, the most recent things that we're pushing, orchestrated with Kubernetes, which basically means as your server comes under mo uh, more load, we can do things like auto-scaling, and then Postgres is a database that you can scale horizontally and vertically. 
So we have customers that are barely doing anything. They're doing like Zapier-like things uh, with Xano. We also have users that uh, store hundreds of millions of records with us. We have large enterprise companies. And if, if you don't want to be on Google Cloud, we even offer the ability to bring your own cloud in our enterprise version. And then you can ramp up whatever resources that you have. So it was very important to us to give our no-code community something that they could start with and they could scale with and stay, and stay with us. So this is, I think, why it's uh, Zeno such an important product, uh, largely to the no-code community. Awesome. So I want to, I kind of want to play around a little bit and uh, with external APIs, because, you know, we just kind of scratched the surface on what Xeno could do. Um, I'm going to bring in a uh, tool called Zipopotamus. So remember, I said that uh, APIs connect our, our world together, right? Uh, and so in Xeno, the cool thing is you can uh, build your own APIs, um, but you can also bring in APIs and use that data with whatever API you're building. So this is an example called Zipopotamus, and they have an API that will take a country and a postal code, right? And then we'll give you all of the information about it. So this is the structure, right? So what I wanna do here, I'm just gonna create a new endpoint. So if I go to add a new endpoint, I'm gonna start from scratch and I'm just gonna call this a random API endpoint, okay? So no inputs from the user in the function stack. The first thing that I wanna do is actually to do an external API request because I'm hitting that external API. And in the URL, um, I'm gonna go ahead and paste in the URL from Zipopotamus. So here, what I can do is I can actually expand that out and I can um, replace the country with US um, because that's where I am currently. And I'm currently in 93401. So when I save this right over here and I run it, it should, in theory, give me back information about San Luis Obispo. There we go. So that's pretty cool. Um, another thing that I can do is like, okay, well, you just use this API endpoint. But what if I wanted to do this based on a user I was fetching from the database? So one thing that I can do is I can go to the database, I can go to the user, and uh, in addition to the uh, email and password, I might want to store exactly what uh, Zipopotamus needs, which is the country and the postal code or the zip code. So I'm gonna add two fields. I'm just gonna call the first country, uh, field country, and then I'm gonna call the next field zip, okay? And so I will say this is uh, US and then uh, 93401. Okay, great. So now that that is done, I can go back to that random API endpoint, which is right over here. And then uh, what I want this endpoint to do, I want you to give me the user's name and then it's gonna look up the user. And then based on the user or the uh, country and zip code they have in their database, I want you to look it up and then return that to me, okay? So what I wanna do is first, I wanna take that input called name, right? And then the first function in the function stack is I wanna actually look up the user. So I'm gonna add a function, I'm gonna do a database request, and I wanna do get a, uh, a single record, right? And I'm gonna go get user. So right now it's gonna look up the user by ID, but I'm gonna have them look it up by the name of the user, okay? And then the text field is the input that the user is, is uh, entering. So I'm saying, look up this user by their name and use what uh, the user is uh, sending from the front end to do that. So I'm gonna sit, I'm gonna hit save. So let me just actually show you what's happened here. So I'm gonna comment this out. Remember that was a Zipopotamus thing. Um, and instead of returning this API one, I'm gonna return user one. So let's return that. So I just wanna show you how this works. All right, so if I run this, it's gonna ask me for the person's name. And so I'm gonna just say Prakash. So I run that, it's gonna find me, right? And again, just to show you that it's really working, if I enter in Josh, if remember he's not a user in our system, we're not gonna find anything, right? So first I'm gonna enter in um, the user that I want, that's Prakash. And then you can see Look, we have a uh, user name is Prakash, email is Prakash at email, and it has my country and my zip code. So now what I want to do is like, okay, well, I want to leverage that information in the next function that I do, which is this Zipopotamus call. So I'm going to click this. And right now I hard coded this, but it, it originally was country. And I think it was like uh, 
postal code, right? It, it doesn't really matter. I'll, I'll tell you why in a second. But let's, I, I want to show you the exact um, way to do this. So I'll just copy and paste it just like I had it. Okay. So it's asking me for a country and a postal code. Okay. So I can actually add a filter to this and I can use a replace filter. This is the cool thing about Dano. And I can say anywhere you see country, um, instead of using uh, the hard coded country, I want you to uh, use what you're getting back from that user. So I'm going to say user.country instead, right? So what I'm saying is, is go to that URL. If you see the word country, replace it with user one, which is what it's returning from here, their country. Okay. So I'm going to say update. So I want to do one more, which is this uh, postal code. So I'm going to add another filter. I'm going to go replace. And then I'm going to say this is um, postal code. And I'm going to replace it with the user one dot zip. I'm pretty sure that's what I did. And so now when I update this, you're going to see Prakash, or actually I'm not returning it yet. Remember, I now I want to return API 1. So I want to add something to the response. I want to do API 1. So now when I return this, I should see the same thing, San Luis Obispo over here. So let me change the zip code so you can see it working in real time. So I'll do 90210, which is popular television show. You, all of you should know that it's Beverly Hills. <laughs> but uh, if I go to uh, this random thing again, and if I run it, it should be Beverly Hills instead, right? So you can see how I just used my own database, got information from that database, and fed it into this third-party API, right? This Zipopotamus API. So Maybe, do we have time for one more? I'll do one more in like five minutes and then we can open it up for more Q&A. So another uh, example I always love to give is this. This is a Star Wars API at swappy.dev, which is amazing, right? It has all, it's like a Wikipedia for Star Wars that you can actually use in your own um, application. So they have, and it's free and public. It doesn't require any authentication. They have things like people, planets, starships, anything that you can think of. So right now, um, the way the API is structured is if I go to planets, right, and I request the planets, it's going to show all of the planets that it has, right, uh, API slash planets. Now, if I, for example, wanted a specific planet, it does it by the ID of that planet. So you can see Tatooine over here. Um, this is uh, planet ID number one. And then if I scroll down uh, further, you know, Dagobah is number three. But no one is going to remember uh, to look up a planet by the ID. They want to look it up by the name, right? And so this is an important point. Sometimes when you're working with external APIs, they're not going to give you it in the format that you want. You have to make it work for you. And this is why a tool like Xano is so awesome. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this in Xano. And let's, let's build a planet finder API using this external API that I just said, swappy.dev. So I'm going to say, um, I just did a, a new endpoint called planet finder. So I just did this planet finder. And in the inputs, I want to add, um, let's call this requested planet. OK? All right. So then here in the function stack, the first thing that I want to do is I just want to show you just connecting to this API endpoint in the URL slash planets. So I want to show you how this works. So right now, I'm just. Um, I'm going to this database, uh, or sorry, I'm going to this API and I'm getting slash planet. So I should see a list of all the planets from this API, swappy.dev, okay? So I'm going to hit run and debug. And I'm not going to put anything in requested planet. We're not even using this right now. So I'm just going to hit run. And if it did it properly, it's going to scroll down and I can see everything here. Now, remember what I taught you earlier. Request response, right? Every API server response is filled with this. It, it tells you what you've requested and what it's returning. But there's a lot of information that it's sending back. What I actually want is just the results of what's in results. I don't want all this e extra header information, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this result, and I'll show you why in a second. And Josh, this is going to be shared with people, right? So they can watch it back. All right, I, I see a thumbs up. All right, so there's my first thing. I can actually go and create, go to data manipulation and create a variable. 
a variable is a container that allows me to do pre pretty much whatever I want with it. I'm just going to call it planets, okay? And I just want to store the planet information. Now here, I'm going to go to this API one and I'm going to click subpath. It allows me to paste in the response of what I was getting and then traverse into that response and get just the results of what I care about, which is just the planets. And I'm going to go ahead and save that. So instead of returning API one, if I return planet, planets rather, um, I should just see now just the planets with all, without all of that random header information. So I've cleaned it up a lot. Okay. And okay. So now that I have all the planets, what I want to do is I want to loop through each planet. And I want to say, if one of these match what the user is asking for, then go ahead and display just that information. Okay. So how do I do that? I'm going to do this thing called a for each loop. Now, a for each loop just goes through each iteration of a list and says, for every one, I want you to do this thing. So I'm going to click add data manipulation um, loops, and I'll do a for each loop. Okay. And so the list that I want to use is the planets. Remember, this is returning just the planets. So I'm going to say this is planets. And I want to return each one as an individual planet. Now, I could have left that as item, but I just want to make it as understandable as possible. All right. So I just did this. For every planet, go through each one, and each one is called planet. Then I want to add a conditional, right? I want to say, if what the user is telling me equals one of the planets that you see, just give me the information about that specific planet. So a conditional, I'm going to add, I'm going to say, if... Um, the requested planet coming in from the input, remember, that's what I specified over here, is actually equal to the individual planet dot name. This is called dot notation because in that request, going into that result, you can just do dot name. And I'm going to hit save this. I'm going to say, and I'll save this. So, so far, we're getting the planets from the Star Wars Planet Finder. We're trimming down that response. We're going through each one of the planets. And we're saying, if what the user is asking for is in here, then I'm going to create a variable, uh, data manipulation create variable. And I'm going to just call this planet result. And what I want to return is just that individual planet that was found, if that matches. So I'm going to now save this, and I'm going to return planet result to the front end. And I'll, ex I'll cover this one last time before I actually run it. So this should be planet result. All right, so stepping back, I use this amazing Star Wars API. I put that as function one. It returned back this massive payload. To, when, to using Xano, I use subpath to trim it down to just the planets. That's item two. Then just the planets, I am looping through each one. And I'm saying, if the requested planet coming from the front end, like if you built a mobile application, it might just have a little input box that said like type, a, type in a Star Wars planet. Then if, if, there, if it equals to the one that actually the user is requesting, well, then it's going to return that planet result. So let's go ahead and run this right now. Right? Requested planet is Tatooine. So in theory, if I did this correctly, I should just be getting back information about Tatooine, which I do, right? This single planet. So this is a simple example to show you that you found this amazing API, right? It has all the information that you want. But in terms of the planets, it's asking you to like go like slash three, right? To, to find the planet that you want. But you're like, look, I want to build an app where someone can look for it by name. So in Xano, we've been able to transform that and do with it what we want. And now this endpoint can be used in any application that you want. So this is important to know that even though APIs connect the world to, um, with one another, the nature of the data will always be different. And you need a tool to transform those things and make it work for you. So this is another example of why a tool like Zapier like, could never do something like this, where you're transforming the data and you would use this instead. So you know, in the course of like really 20 minutes, we've been able to build a little restaurant app, an authenticated restaurant app, a zip code finder, and a Star Wars planet finder. Um, so I'll stop there, and uh, that hopefully gives you a sense of what you're able to do with Xano and what APIs are. If you have any other questions, even if they're super basic, I'm more than happy to answer them for you. I see a question. So about a user's postal code, can I filter a list depending on a user's current mobile location? Is 
a free external API for that? So that is a great question. So a, you, the user's current location is actually given by the front end. So you know how sometimes in um, if you go to Google Maps, it'll say like, oh, this browser wants to know your location. Or on your phone, it says this app wants to know your location. That is because the phone sends over a longitudinal uh, uh, longitude and latitude of that user. So based on a longitude and latitude, you can then use those two points to pinpoint the person's zip code. So I don't know if Zipopotamus takes a longitude and latitude. I don't think it does. Um, but there are other APIs that do. And just so you know how to store that in Xano, in, on the user, for example, like we actually have geography, right? And so if I do a point, for example, I'll just call it location. I'll hit save. We actually have a, we have, we leverage the Google uh, Maps API and we can click it and I can just say um, San Luis Obispo, California, right? And I can like add, add the point here and I can hit save. And then here in this data, or let me just clear that. Um, let me see if I can expand this for you. This is the uh, latitude and longitude of where San Luis Obispo is. So in uh, on the front end, that's where you're, you're passing that land, uh, longitude and latitude, and then you're able to ingest that into any API you want to get more information. All right, next question. What would be the most common alternatives to the apps you just built using traditional code and how much longer would it have taken? Um, it's a good question because if you're hand rolling it from scratch, well, you have to set up your own server. You have to define all the business logic of the programming language of your choice. Um, and then you have to build your own front end. So I, I guarantee you that it would have taken significantly longer than I just I just did it. I, um, I, I don't have an, uh, an objective number, but I would say that at least an hour at, at the very, if you knew exactly what you're doing, at least an hour, probably more. Um, what's the difference between Xano and N8N or Make? N8N and Make, incredible tools. Again, connectors. They basically connect one service to another. There is some business logic and filtering that it allows you to do, but the superpower of Xano is it has this function stack builder along with a database where you're storing information and you can leverage everything together. So we actually have a lot of people that use Integromat alongside or N8N with Xano. So maybe they have already workflows that they have defined that they then want to leverage with a user set that they have in Xano. So even though we can technically do the same thing within our function stack builder, um, we're more than just a connector. We're a complete backend that is the API layer. It's the uh, business logic layer, which is that API layer, the server and the database. All right, we're using MySQL for an existing app. Can I export MySQL database to Xano and we're using Xano moving forward instead of MySQL? Can I use Xano with native applications? So the first question is around ex uh, migrating your existing database in MySQL or otherwise to Xano. This is 100% uh, possible. We don't have a direct database connector, but there are two ways that existing users do this. The first is if you have an API that you build, you can obviously extract out the data that way and send it directly to Xano and we can ingest it. The second way is exporting your SQL database um, into a CSV format. And we have an extremely robust CSV importer. You can upload or import tens of millions of records. Um, those are the two ways that people typically bring data in from an existing uh, database. Now, regarding the question of uh, native applications, absolutely. At the end of the day, remember, we produce API endpoints that you can connect to anything. Now, traditionally, Additionally, those API endpoints have been connected to mobile applications using a native framework like React um, or otherwise. Um, but now these no-code tools also allow you to ingest the API endpoints. So you can use Xano with anything that ingests an API endpoint. Um, hold on. You skipped a question regarding learning resources by Tapan. There's, there's a question I here. Um, on, which I'm I can trying to scroll out. up to see. Have you found it? I didn't. So I don't. Learning resources by Tapan. Are you? Did I miss something? Can you, can you hear me? Okay. I can hear. You. Yes. Yes. Hello. Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll read the question to you. Um. So they're looking to learn the best way to learn API and backend for a newbie to be able to then fully utilize all features of Xano. They've checked out the Xano YouTube channel, but they're looking for more basic resources. 
get started. Oh, I see. Yeah. So we're, you know, we're constantly um, adding more and more videos to the stack. So obviously, so in our Xano YouTube channel, we try to break down or the series of videos that I recommend that you start with is from app to idea. What is a database? What is an API that covers the basics like this around how you can think about going from an idea to an actual uh, application? If you watch all of those videos and you're still confused, I would love to hear from you. Just you can direct message me on Twitter just to say like where you might be confused so we can figure out better content to push out to the community. Um, so I think it's it's really just starting with those videos that I just mentioned. Also, when you sign up for Xano and you indicate that you're a beginner in our little onboarding flow, we send you different types of content and we will present you different types of content within the application. Um, Okay, uh, so yep, okay, community, community.zano.com looks good. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, so if, it, yeah, where did you build for the onboard flow? So um, the onboarding flow, let me just go ahead and create a new instance so people can see this. Uh, it looks like this, right? So when you describe your backend knowledge, we basically take this to help tailor your experience. So I'm assuming most of the people that are in this channel are beginners. So that's what you would select. If you're using a front end, you can certainly let us know because we have content for each one of these individual ones. Um, and then if you're bringing in data from another service, you can tell us that too. And we serve up that uh, uh, initial content. Based on what you say, um, you know, we'll, uh, we'll tell you how to get started, right? You can start from scratch, which is kind of what I did, right? I just did a user table. You can import from Airtable if you're coming to us from there. Or if you're like building, for example, an Airbnb type clone, you might want to start with a rental marketplace. Um, so there's a, a number of different ways to get started. I hope that's helpful. Great. If you could convince one of your expert users, design a Udemy course style, build a more complex app from scratch. Yeah, um, I think this is something that we um, we think about a lot. Like, how do we build things that um, are really going to um, hit the mark and help people upskill if they have no idea how uh, APIs and backends work? I hope that workshops like this uh, were informative in, in helping you do that. But um, we are looking to do more detailed courses uh, around bringing people uh, from like nothing to like actually a more complex um, application. Are there any front ends that you like more than others? Um, you know, front end tools, it's, uh, it's, it's so based on preference and I genuinely mean that. So what I usually like to tell people is depending on what you're building, like the first thing you need to think about is like, do you want to start with a native mobile application or a web application? Because you're immediately going down a certain path if you do. So for example, Bubble, great web application builder. And even though they have a wrapper, they're not a native mobile application builder. So then you have to like look at other tools like DraftBit or Adalo or Bravo Studio if you want to do those native mobile applications. Now within the world of uh, web applications, as you know, there's lots, there's Bravo Studio, there's, uh, or sorry, not Bravo Studio, there's Builder, there's WeWeb, there's um, uh, now UIFlow, there's so many different tools. What I usually tell people is build uh, an app, a simple list view, like let's say your kitchen app, a simple list view, click on that item and see that individual view, for example, like a cheeseburger and see how far you can get and how easy it was to use. I would do that in three to four different tools, whatever you feel the most comfortable with, that's where I would go. Because honestly, like that, like it's so uh, a preference and it's so uh, subjective around what tools people prefer and like better, but all of them are really uh, awesome. But I would also go with tools that are really community oriented because you're not going to have all of the answers as you're building. Just make sure that you have resources to go to and people to reach out to that can help you. I'm trying to get to all of them, but I, I think I got them. Thank you, Colin. Awesome. awesome. Well, that's that's pretty much it. So um, if you're brand new to Xano, um, then I recommend that you uh, please go sign up at this link. link. It's go.xano.co slash NCF. Uh, we'll actually, if you sign up within the next 48 hours, uh, we'll apply our orientation $100 credit to your account. So you can use the free account, but if you choose to upgrade, you're going to have that uh, alongside with you. 
come to our office hours. We have office hours three times a week where we basically help anyone that's using Xano overcome challenges, right? And then finally, our YouTube tutorials, as I mentioned, we are constantly trying to add better content there uh, to help you be successful. And then you can follow us on Twitter um, using no code backend. So, um, so hopefully that, uh, that does it. We're at time. I really appreciate it again, Josh. Thank you so much for having us. I hope that was helpful. I really appreciate everyone that stuck around and, and joined and hopefully y'all got something out of this. Thank you. Thank you, Prakash. And thank you for the credit for, for all the members as well. That's really great. So please do sign up for Xano, everyone, and give it a try. Um, it's definitely different from some of the other no-code tools out there. So um, I think you'll learn something um, just by playing around with it. And thank you so much, Prakash, for all your time. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And we'll be doing another one of these in a couple of weeks' time. So keep an eye on the site. And we'll see you all soon. All right. Thanks, see ya. Bye.